So we're here to talk today about why racial justice is a climate justice issue. Um, and thank you guys so much for having us. We're really excited to talk about this. Um, and yeah, thank you for giving up or giving us your evening. Um, I'm Ichaso and I use she, her pronouns. I'm Chris and I use he, him pronouns. I'm Liana, I use she or they pronouns. My name is Mukta, I use she, her pronouns. Jennifer, she, her pronouns. So to start off, we're gonna do a land acknowledgement to honor both the land and the indigenous people whose land we are currently on. Next slide. So right now we're all occupying unceded land. And before I start, I would love for us all to enter into the chat the names of the indigenous people whose land we currently aren't on. If you don't happen to know, you can use the website at the bottom right corner, nativeland.ca, or Mukta just entered it into the chat to find out whose land you're currently on. So as those are getting entered into the chat, I just want to start by saying that the original people of the land who I stand right now, their names are the Chichenyo Ohlone people, and they called Oakland Huchin. In acknowledging that I live my life on stolen land, I draw closer to the truth of what this nation was built on. Militarized land grabs, genocide, and the destruction of languages, stories, ways of being in relationship with the land. In acknowledging this truth together, Ask yourself, how are you currently in relationship with those whose land you live on? Let us take actions both big and small, both today and tomorrow, that draw us closer to reconciliation and reparations for the violence committed. Let us honor those indigenous first peoples who have survived and thrived and are still alive. Um, in the chat, I'm seeing the Ramatush Ohlone, the Chichenyo Ohlone, the Anishinaabe land in northern Minnesota. And so may we collectively all take this moment to not only recognize the first people of the land on which we all occupy in this moment, but also to the first people of the lands on which our resources come from. For in this moment, we are inextricably linked to many lands, the minerals that created the computer you're now using, the land that the food you ate for dinner grew on, the lands that your drinking water ran through before landing in your cup. And so finally, let us turn our attention to the land itself and to recognize that it is the source of all of our resources. Next slide. In acknowledging the stolen land that we occupy, Sunrise, we also want to acknowledge the discriminatory and racist policies that have continued a legacy of inequitable access to land and resources. This is known as redlining. And as you can see on the map, um, this was drawn 80 years ago by the Homeowners Loan Corporation. This is Oakland, Berkey, Berkeley, and Alameda. Uh, as you can see in the map, neighborhoods were color-coded to signal to bankers which communities were worthy of investment. Those were the green and the blue neighborhoods. And you can also see that neighborhoods in the red, they were rated based on their racial demographic and their economic class, meaning that these communities were less likely to be given loans and they were less likely to be invested in. The green zones that you see were prime locations for investments due to their white, high white populations. And thus this created a cycle that um, folks, it started increasing their property value. Whereas, for example, as you can see West Berkeley, West Oakland and East Oakland in the red, uh, they were not invested in in the same ways. And so that has led and prevented them to rising population or property values. In many ways, Redline has had a lasting impact on communities of color and it has become one of the most generationally pervasive tools for producing and reinforcing 
these economic segregation and inequality in the United States. So I w thank you for um, taking the time to just recognize the truth of how this land came to be that we're all on. Um, it is really important to folks at Sunrise to acknowledge where we are in this current moment. Next slide. So to sort of contextualize more specifically why we are giving this presentation, um, I want to sort of give a very brief introduction to Sunrise, what we do and what our sort of goals are. So Sunrise is a movement of young people looking to stop the climate crisis and create millions of good jobs in the process. Our primary policy objective is to get political and people support for the Green New Deal. Um, and so in order to explain why, because normally when we give a presentation, we talk a lot about the climate crisis, which we're still going to do. We talk about our theory of change for how we get from where we are to the Green New Deal, which we're still gonna do. And we also talk about the Green New Deal specifically, what its components are. This presentation is a little different because we're not going to emphasize the Green New Deal as much. We're more interested in talking about the intersections between climate justice and racial justice. And to explain why we're doing that today and why we're doing that in this specific political moment, I wanna sort of give a shortened introduction to our theory of change. Um, so our theory of change is just basically our ideas about how we go from the status quo to getting the Green New Deal passed. Um, and it has a couple of different components. The first one, is building people power, which basically means getting people organized, getting people involved in Sunrise, and doing the sort of things that you think about when you think about social movements, protests, et cetera. Building political power means that a lot of what Sunrise is doing, especially right now with the primaries, is supporting politicians who will take the no fossil fuel money pledge, helping them uh, oust Democratic incumbents who are sort of uh, helping the oil industry. So we've supported candidates like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, and we think that it's important to get both people organized and to get elected officials to support the Green New Deal. And so that's the second component. I'm going to skip the third component and you'll understand why in a second. The fourth component is mass non-cooperation, which we're sort of seeing right now in a different context. But that's basically our end goal of once we have enough people power and once we've built political power, we think that that is the way that we sort of finally get real substantial climate policy passed uh, at the national level. The third component is building the people's alignment. And what that means uh, is basically allying ourselves with other movements that we think are sort of sharing our goals. And so if you go to the next slide, we think it's really important to sort of form partnerships with groups that we see as sort of in solidarity with Sunrise's mission. And that crosses a lot of different sectors, right? So there are some climate justice groups that we think are worth allying with, like some of the large green environmental NGOs. Um, we also think that uh, there are some labor groups, for example, union uh, movements and sort of teachers other varieties of uh, things in the labor field that we think are sort of aligned with progressive goals. There's also the sort of sustainable business community, whether that's B corporations or regenerative agriculture, which is sort of like urban Hadama almost. Um, and finally, obviously racial justice groups we think are very intertwined with Sunrise in terms of the things that we're fighting for. And because we think it's so important to kind of form connections with these other groups so that we can all help each other achieve our goals. We're talking today primarily about the intersections between racial and climate justice, um, because supporting the movement for black lives in this particular political moment, we think is really important. Yeah, and we wanted to talk in more detail about the political moment that we're living in right now. Next slide. We are living in a moment of change, pain, and uprising. Everything in the world has changed very quickly, very recently, 
two months ago feels like a lifetime ago and January feels like last year. And there is a lot of pain in the world right now with the coronavirus and uncertainty and social isolation and the fact that even before the current moment of mass non-cooperation, um, the coronavirus was already disproportionately impacting Black people and people of color. And, and now we're in an uprising for um, the fight for justice for Black lives in this country. Next slide. We are living in a system that values profit over life. And that is the core of what is causing, has caused a lot of the um, racial injustices that we're going to talk about in this presentation. And we can't fix our problems by quote unquote fixing the system that exists. It was designed to oppress people for, for the benefit of the rich and wealthy and um, white. And so we must create a new system that values life over profit. Next slide. Malcolm X said that you can't have capitalism without racism. And that is true because capitalism requires us, or requires um, businesses and systems to exploit uh, groups of people who can't fight back or have been put in a position where it's harder to fight back. And that has manifested as racism. Next slide. Um, okay, so I think we're going to try something if you guys um, are interested, or I'm going to do it anyway, but we're going to try just a breakout room. And before we do that, I want to share a personal anecdote um, of how I got passionate about nature and about the environment. Um, and it really starts from my family and I used to go hiking a lot. I've always lived near coastal systems. So um, a lot of time on the beach. We, I learned how to sail from a young age, um, spent a lot of time in mountains camping. Um, and this is what really led me to start, ha foster fostered me to have this kind of belief, intrinsic belief in nature and that we need to protect and preserve it. But with that, I'm starting to unpack what, it, what kind of privilege I had by being able to ha go on hikes and have a car to go to national parks and the fact that me and my family are white. And so we feel safe in these spaces. Um, and before we go really deep into examples of ra racial um, injustice and the climate justice, uh, I was hoping we could all just take a moment and speak with each other about maybe how we were exposed to the environment and to nature and what kind of things or privileges we have within that. Um, so we're going to do breakout rooms of, of like three people, I believe, and we're going to do like five minutes just to talk about it before we deep dive. Uh, dive deeper. Uh, and Jesse should be able to help us out with that. I'm going to whoosh you all into breakout rooms in just a moment. Awesome. I'll put the question in the chat too. Thank you. Okay, I believe everybody's in their breakout rooms except for you all, the hosts. Should we start, do we start a, a timer? There's a timer happening in the breakout rooms. Thank you, Jesse, that's awesome. Yeah. What do you uh, guys think? I, I can broadcast a message to them when it's, uh, um, when it's half time. Okay. Y'all are crushing it. <laughs> I feel like that was a really awkward introduction to that breakout room. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, each professor like that, that resonated with me. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that story. And I think you, you set it up in a way to be like kind of vulnerable. And I think like really phrasing it as like an ongoing unpacking. And I especially liked how you're like, feel safe in these places. I think that was really powerful too. Thanks for coming back. Um, 
I, we shared some stories in our personal breakout room too, which I didn't know about my fellow presenters. So I hope you guys all um, were able to talk about, you know, your first experiences and why those were different than maybe other people's. Um, and moving into our main presentation, why racial justice is a climate justice. Um, it's really vital when we think about this to understand that race is the most significant factor of a person living near polluted soil, air, and water. And the fight to end uh, racial and en environmental racism embraces the concept that all communities have the right to, to equal potential of housing, transportation, and energy. And I think of this as just the right to have a safe neighborhood and for your kids to be able to play outside without having a really heavily polluted environment. And we're gonna break this down in urban, rural, and in global settings, just so we can kind of peek at and try to understand what these implications are in a bunch of different settings. So the first one that I'm gonna talk about is urban and urban or cities. Um, and most of these examples that we're gonna talk about here are within the Bay Area and um, within Berkeley, within Oakland. So we're gonna be really grounded in where we are right now. Um, so in the Bay Area, shaded are diff highly polluted spots of uh, um, air pollution and pollution much like wealth is not distributed equal in the United States and here as well. And these cities, as you can kind of see, are usually closer to highways, to ports, to um, different kinds of industries as well as hazardous waste um, areas. And so these areas, Richmond, parts of Oakland, Hayward, are going to have higher rates of air pollution, lower rates of um, clean water, which has a really heavy toll, toll on the quality of life. And right now we're focusing a lot on air quality with this, uh, with this uh, graphic, just because I think it's something that comes to mind for Bay Area and Californians in general, living near a city, and then also having fires to consider consider we're always thinking about our air pollution and air quality and then remembering that map and when we look at this one this one shows kind of the historical his, shows the historical implications of the redlining that Liana had talked about earlier and so UC Berkeley and UCSF did the study that showed that um, asthma related emergency room visits were directly correlated with this historical redlining of this community. So these maps were drawn in 1935 and 1940 and they're having health, deadly health effects right now in these communities that living, are living in the redlined areas to the point where the people that are still living in these hazard zones as they were marked have 2.5 times higher chance than people who aren't of going to the emergency room for an asthma related incident. And a lot of the people that live in these areas are people of color. And you're seeing this kind of nation nationally as well, where you have Latino and black children at the highest rates of asthma of the whole country, as, as opposed to their white counterparts. Um, and then when we talk about solutions, this is clearly a huge problem, but even the solutions aren't equitable. So if we're thinking about, again, this uh, idea of air pollution, some of the solutions we might use are would be planting trees or using a cap and trade agreement with different companies. But there's also studies that show that these trees are more likely to be planted in green and wealthier areas where these come, and also that the companies can just buy carbon offsets and continue to spew the toxins in the neighborhoods that they were before. So the people who are being hurt are still harmed, even if you're offering these solutions, because they're just going to communities that were better off to begin with. So another example I wanted to bring up was that it was um, in Emeryville, what is now known as Emeryville. And, and before we talk about this, I just want to draw the importance of this example to me and to the presenters is that where there's been direct harm, there's also really strong stories of resilience, especially in, in these communities of color. So this area of now Emeryville and Berkeley is known as like the parking lot for um, the Bay Street Mall. And there's like a, 
old navy there i think there's like a uniqlo um but it was actually built on the sacred the sacred shell mound of the ohlone people and it actually has more than 5,000 years of history there where there's burial grounds, there were ceremonies, and there's villages that were completely moved or destroyed in order for industries. Um, and just to put that into context, 5,000 years of history, 5,000 years is older than the pyramids and it's older than like a site like Jerusalem. And this is, has been completely wiped out since like the 1920s actually, where they had, um, Emeryville was kind of forced by the state law to call the Ohlone descendants to um, monitor the site and determine what to do about these burials. But before any set any of these Ohlone people could make any decisions, the city decided that the soils had too many toxins from the hazardous waste that the industries had put there to um, be able to be reclaimed and so took it back and developed it further. And I really want to touch on this because it's an example that the system of oppressions favor profit over human lives like we talked about, but more importantly that the people will always stand in opposition to this environmental injustice. Um, and there's group, they, these groups will continue to stand in unison to protest the use of stolen land, even though these actions will largely be ignored by mainstream media. Um, there's been proud protests here since like um, on Black Friday for the last couple of years where people go and protest these malls. So it's a direct example here of the resilience in urban communities. Um, and then we're gonna talk about rural examples. So let's take a look at how environmental racism impacts rural communities of color. Next slide. In this country, land ownership is a form of wealth and power. So we need to ask the question, who owns this country's farmland? As you can see in the graph on the left, in 1910, one in seven farmers were African American and owned nearly 16 to 19 million acres of farmland. But almost immediately after that, Black ownership of farmland started to decrease, as you can see in the graph. Um, this was due to the USDA's discriminatory practices through federal farm programs. And so over the course of just 100 years, 100 years that you can see in that graph, 98% of Black farmers lost their land. I'll say that again, 98% of black farmers lost their land. These farmers were often denied loans and credit. They lacked access to legal defense against fraud and experienced outright acts of violence and intimidation through federal programs. We're used to thinking that our government will protect us and um, our government did not protect these folks and their land. So today in 2020, less than 1% of farmland is black owned with 98% of private rural land being owned by white people. As you can see on the right, it shows um, a demographic breakdown of who owns the farmland in this country. It's also important to consider who works the land and who owns the wealth that the land and the labor produce. So let's go to the next slide. On the topic of farmland ownership, this quote is from Will Scott. Uh, Will Scott is a California farmer and president of the African American Farmers of California. Will said, in California, if you have to start from scratch, it's expensive. It's expensive to sustain yourself and then not have access to the marketplace. Black farmers have been excluded from that. It all falls back on us. For young people coming up, if they want to get into farming, they are prohibited. They need training, experience, and money to buy the products they need to farm. So like Will Scott says, Black farmers continue to experience discrimination in access to credit, seeds, and other assistance. So not only did they lose their land, but they also are experiencing inequitable obstacles to getting um, farmland. And so they face foreclosure at six times the rate of their white counterparts. 
Next slide. Now let us consider who works the land. How are these farm workers treated in this society? Is their health and well being valued? So let's take a look at a current example in Immokalee, Florida. Immokalee is a small agricultural community that is rising up and organizing to demand farm worker protections, especially most recently as it pertains to the coronavirus. So on the left, you can see the graph and the timeline of COVID developing in Immokalee, Florida. On the right, you see how it happened. You see that these workers are bussed out in very close proximity to each other to work in the fields every day at 4 a.m. They are not given protective gear and um, they go from farm to farm. So they are not working on just one farm, they're working on multiple farms, which often leads to less protection by the um, farm owner. So Florida's governor, Governor DeSantis, was one of the first governors to reopen Florida's economy, uh, despite inadequate testing and contact tracing. They were just not ready to open up. These farm workers, they have been organizing for protective gear and free testing since April 1st. They're considered essential workers. We all need them, every single one of us here. We need farm workers. And these farm workers had demanded that Governor DeSantis take steps to protect them and their farming community from the spread of coronavirus. It wasn't until May 3rd, more than a month later after they had demanded on April 1st that they need protection, that the Immokalee workers received any sort of testing. I have been to Immokalee myself, and it is a town that is um, very separate from other parts of Florida. It's very rural. And so to not be able to access coronavirus testing um, while working in very close quarters is huge. You can see in the graph on the left, the timeline that uh, Governor DeSantis didn't act in April was the most important moment to take action and protect these folks. So on May 3rd, they only set up about three test sites and they were all impermanent. They only lasted three days. Whereas in Florida's most affluent coastal cities, free drive up testing started three weeks earlier. And so we can see the discrepancies in access to um, proper safety. And as you can see in the graph, um, yeah, Governor DeSantis, failed his, his constituents, the very people that grow his food, and you wanna know his response. It's really wild. Uh, next slide. So his response when asked during a recent press conference whether his decision to uh, reopen Florida was safe. And he said, um, instead of taking responsibility for the sudden rise in COVID-19 in Florida, he pointed the, his finger at some of the poorest and least powerful constituents in his state. This is the most powerful man in Florida, pointing his finger at the least powerful people and saying, I think the number one outbreak we've seen is in the agricultural communities. What happens is these workers are working close together and once one gets it, it tends to spread in the area. The next thing is really wild. He says, you don't want those folks mixing with the general public if you have an outbreak. So Governor DeSantis is essentially saying that these farm workers are not the general public, that they are not Floridians and that they are not worthy of being protected because he had more than a month to act and help these folks in um, the agricultural community get prepared for the outbreak of this disease. Next slide. I really love this quote by Hop Hopkins. Hop Hopkins is the Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Sierra Club. And Hop says, if we valued everyone's lives equally, if we placed the public health and well-being of the many above the profits of a few, there wouldn't be a climate crisis. There would be nowhere to put a coal plant. 
because no one would accept the risks of living near such a monster if they had the power to choose. And I think that's a, this is a really powerful quote in reflection of um, the Immokalee workers because the Immokalee workers were doing everything right. They had communicated with their, um, their representatives and they just didn't have the power to choose. And yet the people who had the power to choose pointed a finger and said, oh no, it's actually your fault. So we're, we're learning who, who is actually at fault here. Next slide. So, next slide. Currently, as our nation confronts police brutality all over the country, let us not forget that this is not an isolated incident at all. In the case of the Dakota Access Pipeline, the Standing Rock Sioux tribe spent months peacefully defending their sacred land and waters from the invasion of a pipeline their right to live and love without being exposed to toxic chemicals. These water protectors stood up against um, these industries, these dangerous yet powerful fossil fuel industry, an industry that deemed their land a sacrifice zone, a really key word, a sacrifice zone, an industry that was willing to put the Sioux and their drinking water at danger an industry that has no respect for the sacredness of land and in fact called the cops. Um, and the police response was immediate and violent like we are seeing now with riot gear. The police brutally beat Sioux water defenders and the police used tear gas and weapons of destruction. So my question is who were the police really protecting? Were they protecting the people? Were they protecting the land, the property? But whose land and property do the police serve to protect? A, que uh, a really important question. Next slide. You can't have climate change without sacrifice zones. You can't have sacrifice zones without disposable people. And you can't have disposable people without racism. Really important to note who is being centered by these industries and the benefits that they reap. Next slide, please. So this is also near my home in Florida. Um, in Miami, sea level rise has caused a lot of properties from, further from the coast to skyrocket in price. So there, this has been called climate gentrification due to the rising seas the beachfront properties that are normally so beautiful, so um, expensive, are no longer as desirable as they were. So this has sparked high profile developers to seek out less expensive properties, usually the properties that are inland um, for development. And so these inland communities are historically low income communities of color. In Miami, this is, there is a community called Little Haiti, and it is one of the first communities to experience what is being called climate gentrification. Little Haiti is um, long-term Haitian residents that fled Haiti from a dictatorship. And now we're seeing that they're also having to flee the forces of capitalism and the forces of climate change. This trend can be tracked globally though. It's not only in Miami, the UN has estimated that nearly 50 million and to 200 million, that's a lot of people, a lot of families, a lot of life, often the most vulnerable populations could be displaced by 2050 because of climate change, because of the rising seas, because they will no longer have a place to live. And also because inland properties will become much more expensive, much more coveted. Where do you go when you're forced from your, your home? These long-term residents of Little Haiti are rising up though. They're, they're demanding affordable housing and they're demanding that these development plans center community members. And so this is a perfect example of how housing justice is connected to climate justice. As you can see in the, um, the people's alignment, Sunrise, we stand in solidarity with these communities that are powerful and they're people-led movements for justice and housing. Next slide. 
The final way that we think climate justice and racial justice really interconnect is thinking about how climate change is going to impact people in the global south who are primarily people of color. Um, so next slide. So this is a map that shows which countries are most responsible for climate change. Um, so in other words, it looks at historical emissions um, and tracks who, it distorts the size of the country based on who has emitted the most. So you can see pretty clearly here that the US and Europe are the primary contributors to climate change. You see Africa, South America, Australia, fairly small contributions. Um, and then you have East Asia a little bit larger, um, primarily because of the recent sort of rise of China. Um, but when you look at what countries are going to be impacted the most by climate change, it actually looks quite different, right? Next slide. Oh, but before we get there, sorry, I forgot. Um, you can also cut this another way, which is looking at emissions by wealth instead of emissions by country, right? And if you do that, which is the next slide, um, you see pretty much the same trend, which is that the richest 10% of people are responsible for about half of all emissions, whereas the bottom 50% are responsible for only 10% of emissions. So clearly there are some groups of people who are disproportionately responsible for climate change. But as I was saying earlier, <laughs> when you look at who's going to be harmed the most, the picture looks completely different. Um, next slide. Yeah, so this is from the Climate Change Vulnerability Index. It looks at which countries are most at risk from climate change. And the data is a little bit outdated, but the general trend is still there. You see the countries like in South America and Africa and parts of Southeast Asia are basically along the equator is the most heavily impacted by climate change. Whereas the US and Europe are actually, we're not going to do very well but we're doing comparatively better than a lot of other places. Next slide. So in other words, there's a really significant injustice inherent in climate change, which is that the people who created the problem are the people who are least impacted and the people who did not contribute are the people most impacted by climate change. And when we think about what that actually looks like, it's important to just sort of contextualize what climate change means for people in the global south. Next slide. So this is just an image I chose of a dead crop um, because I think the important thing about climate change is that there is so many different ways that it impacts people in the global south, right? You have sea level rise that forces people to leave their homes, flooding that creates a refugee crisis, extreme weather events like monsoons, hurricanes, that also displace people. You have just heat waves in the summer that kill people if they're not in air conditioned houses, which is obviously a much larger problem outside of the US and Europe. But one thing that I think is just really foundational is people's ability to feed themselves. Um, and even here, climate change impacts our ability to have enough food in a lot of different ways, right? Rising temperatures over the long term cause previously productive land to be turned into desert, basically, which is sort of what's happened here. You have insects and pests that can really do damage to crops spread more easily in hotter weather. You have summer heat waves that cause massive crop die-offs, which happened in the United Kingdom even a couple of years ago. And you also have things like droughts, which we had for like seven years straight in California. All of these factors combined and even more mean that people are projecting that by 2100, we'll have 35 to 50% less food. And when you think about that and what that means for people who are already living on $2 a day and already spending large portions of their income trying to feed themselves, it's catastrophic. Like, like there is no way that a lot of people will just be able to do the basic things of eating enough food to survive. There's also a portion of climate change that's thinking sort of about who benefits from trying to solve it. Um, next slide. Even here in the global south, 
the people who benefit from solutions to climate change are not the people who live on the land right now. So the EU has a cap and trade program in which kind of like Ichasa was talking about earlier, companies can pay money to protect forests and then emit more CO2. What this has looked like in practice is companies hire private security firms to violently kick out indigenous groups in the global south and then the private security firm grabs land basically um, like in india and kicks all of the local residents out and then basically holds the land by by force to protect the forest that is on the land so that companies can keep emitting um, and so there's a bunch of other examples of similar trends like this but the important thing is to really recognize that it's crucial that when we try to solve climate change, we do it in a way that respects the people who already live on the land and have been caring for it and maintaining the forests for generations. Next slide. Yeah, so just like in cities or in the Dakota Access Pipeline, indigenous groups in the global south are also on the sort of front lines of resistance to like forest land grabbing. This image is from a protest against those practices that I was talking about with the EU's cap and trade program. Um, and I really like NCO2 colonialism because it's a really apt way of capturing the way that climate change is sort of a new way that, that former colonial powers are doing real damage to the global south. Um. Okay, I want to thank all my presenters that went before too, because those are really amazing examples of how environmental racism is doing really harmful damages to the world around us and in our community. Um, and the next couple of slides, uh, I want to make, I want to kind of focus in on the movement itself and the climate change movement and sunrise and maybe some of the people we've heard and the things that we thought about before. So um, if everyone could do me a favor and could you think of the faces that come to mind when you think of the environmental movement and would you please write them in the chat just so we start to think about yeah the voices the leaders um the ideas uh who you think who are you thinking about john muir yeah Mm-hmm, Rebecca Solnit, <laughs> Greta Thunberg, <laughs> yep, Greta. Awesome, thank you guys so much. Um, so here are some of the people that I think we mentioned. John Muir's on there, Greta's on there, we have Al Gore. Um, and one thing I wanna point out that comes to mind immediately when I look at this is uh, these are all white faces, right? These are, um, Usually the, the many of the people that we think of when we think of the climate movement and the leaders are all white. Um, and kind of in contrast to that, I do want to bring up that often people of color are who are leading the climate movement are forgotten about by the mainstream media are ignored by other parts of the movement. Um, and I wanted to point out some leaders who I think were really amazing, who were people of color that are doing really great work within this movement. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go through all of them, but I'll make sure we include their names and like the reason what they're working on so you guys can check them out too. Um, and then another really quick kind of thought experiment that I wanted to do is what kind of images and places come to mind when you think of the movement or what comes to mind when you think of the places that will most likely be harmed by climate change? And feel free to drop them in the chat. We're gonna do this again. Yeah, redwood forests, that's a big one for here. Recycling arrows, polar bears, of course. Yeah, so I think Snowy Owl, also a great one. Um, I think of coral reefs. Um, and I actually got this screen grab from an article that said 14 places most affected by climate change. And 
all of these places that we're thinking of are, you know, animals, they're very remote areas of nature. Oftentimes they're um, maybe other countries, other locations, and they're animals, right? Cute animals. And I really want to analyze, because I remember being taught about climate change, and I remember learning about the polar bears and the melting ice caps, but I want to analyze why is it that we think of, you know, the polar bear and the coral reefs and the, like, polar the ice caps and not maybe the communities that are breathing in toxins right here. Like, why aren't we thinking about the humans in our neighborhood and in our communities? And why are we thinking more about polar bears and um, fish and nature? And those are also very important, but I want to prioritize human life too. And I, thinking about that again, if we zoom out of the March's organizers and the March's participants, um, you can see that the American public has always been very diverse in the people that are supporting climate change. And you think with all this talk about need for diversity, especially what I'm talking about right now, um, you would think that most of the people who are fighting for climate change are white, but the, actually the total opposite is true, where you have this racial gap of most of the people that believe that climate change is a top priority are non-white people. And these are the people who care most aren't represented and they're the people that are also going to be impacted the most. And one thing you could be thinking of is like, okay, this might be a bit partisan. Um, Democrats are usually more in favor of regulation, government regulation when it comes to climate change. And there's more minority people in, in Democrats, but the same racial gap exists also in Democrats. So again, the people who care most are not the ones being represented by clearly by our movement when we think about who's in it. And I also want to acknowledge that the presenters, we are all mostly white people too. And Sunrise is also a lot of mostly white people as well. So this is kind of an internal problem that we have and we're dealing with too. Um, and then, and that what this is one of the reasons that we're thinking about it too in sunrise and with our group of people and the presenters is that not only will inclusion and diversity make more efficient problem solving and it'll bring new solutions and more effective strategies but there's just more black and latino people that already believe that they're willing to make a change and participate in a campaign than white americans and this means effectively that there's 23 million Black Americans who already care deeply about the environment. And this is significant because there's a gap in the stories that are being told about climate change. Um, and clearly, it's not just the inconvenient truth in the polar bears. Um, it is the communities of colors that are being impacted the most by climate change and thus care the most um, that needs to become the main narrative. Racial inequality, the racial inequality crisis is intertwined with the climate crisis. And if we don't work on both, we will succeed at neither. And I hope that everyone can walk away, you know, we're being reminded that if you care about making this planet um, a healthy one and having a healthy future for our many generations to come, you need to be actively anti-racist. Yeah, um, thank you for making those, excellent points about environmental racism and why it's important to address racism now. And now I want to go into a little bit about how to address racism right now. Next slide. I'm going to go into two um, policy proposals by the Movement for Black Lives, which is a coalition of Black-led groups uh, across the United States. One that I'm sure you've heard about either on the news or on social media is defund the police. The police were started in this country as slave patrols. And so their core purpose from the start, their inception was to oppress black people in this country and to take away their rights and control them. For, and the amount of money that the police department gets takes away money from services that have been proven to actually make our communities safer. A higher police presence doesn't make people safer. They arrest people for crimes that shouldn't be crimes, like sleeping on the sidewalk or sleeping in their car. 
um, the Oakland Police Department takes almost half the city's general fund. Nearly the same amount of money goes into funding parks and recreation, transportation, housing and community development, economic and workforce development, public works, and the public libraries combined. Redirecting money away from the police department and into schools and workforce development and public housing and healthcare are all effective ways to actually make our community safer in a way that is equitable and anti-racist. Another example that I really like that I pulled screen grab from Instagram is just like envisioning a world without police because they're everywhere and it can be difficult to envision what it would look like when they aren't there. And one example is that like sometimes police pull people over for broken brake lights and then you get a ticket and then you still have to drive home with broken brake lights and then you have to go pay to get them fixed and it's expensive and scary and for some reason when the police officer pulls you over for your taillight he still has a gun and that shouldn't that's not necessary and so in a world without police you a city employee could tell you that you your brake lights are broken help you fix them and then you can go on your merry way home and your drive home will be safer because your taillight is fixed and it shouldn't be a scary traumatizing experience next slide another policy um, point of movement for black lives is building political power uh, there are five points of how to do that were to end the criminalization of black political activity public publicly finance elections election protection electoral expansion and the right to vote for all people full access to technology, including net neutrality and access to internet, and protection and increased funding for Black institutions like HBCUs, Black media, and cultural, political, and social formations. Next slide. I wanted to go a little bit more into that first point about in decriminalizing Black political activity. One example of that is that the FBI terrorism unit has said previously that, quote unquote, Black identity extremists pose a violent threat and to the country or yeah and they cite concerns of reality re, retaliation over quote perceptions of police brutality against african americans uh, and this article was published in the guardian in 2018 so it's very very recent that the fbi is still declaring it illegal and or is still criminalizing black political activity very recently in this current moment of um, um, political uprising a black led organization in oakland tried to ship out a coronavirus masks that said defund the police and stop killing black people and those masks were seized from usps over security concerns next slide Another important part of building political power for Black people in this country is to decrease the incarceration rate and give voting rights to people who are previously incarcerated. Uh, right now, because the police have so much power and because the police were created as slave patrols, the rate at which Black people are arrested is disproportionately higher, are incarcerated is disproportionately higher. Black people make up about 12% of the US population, but 30, almost 35% of the prison population, which is not fair and not right. Next slide. I also wanted to bring it really local and talk about the Black New Deal, which was proposed by the Anti-Police Terror Project um, a couple months ago during the, the ongoing coronavirus pandemic and talk and they it was it's a whole list of policy proposals that they are demanding to address the inequities of coronavirus and its inequitable impacts on black people in Oakland and we can send out the link for the entire black new deal and the follow up to this presentation and i encourage everyone to read it next slide And now I, I want to go into how we all as individuals and collectively can take action for Black lives now. Firstly, you can donate. 
redistribute money and resources to black educators and organizations. You can also show up and showing up doesn't have to just mean physically going to protests. It can mean signing petitions and protesting and calling your legislators and calling into school board meetings and city council meetings and yeah. And another one is patronizing black businesses. Patronizing black businesses, especially local black businesses, helps reverse, not reverse, but address the issues that come with gentrification and taking away their economic power and giving those organizations money and using and going to those businesses helps address that. Next slide. <clears throat> Another thing you can do is learn, unlearn, and research, and change your daily habits of the media can, you consume and who, you, who and what you pay attention to. Next slide. You can also start a conversation with your, your friends and families and neighbors, and very importantly, vote. Something I learned only a couple weeks ago is that the sh police sheriff is an elected position which means if the sheriff is racist, we can vote them out. And most importantly, meaningfully donate your money and time to black organizations. A couple examples of this are if you are a lawyer, you can represent protesters pro bono, or if you're a doctor, give free medical care to black people who've lost their insurance because of the coronavirus. Um, an example of how Sunrise is doing this is we are taking our like skills that we currently have and use generally for climate organ organizing and redirecting that into organizing for Black Lives Matter. So the art team is doing art builds for Black Lives Matter protests. And now uh, we, we, we're going to break out into breakout rooms one more time. And I want everyone to share what they're going to do this week and this month to take action for Black Lives. And the, sharing this in small groups is just a way of holding yourself accountable and holding your community accountable to the actions that you're saying you're going to take. And we'll have um, five minutes per breakout room so everyone can share for uh, one to two minutes and then discuss. Okay, I'm going to split you up into breakout rooms in just a moment. Okay, I wish you away now. I put the question in the chat. We survived. 